All right, our next speaker is Dr. Stuart Hardigree. Uh, Stuart is a plant physiologist with the USDA Agricultural Research Service in Boise, Idaho. His research has focused on the characterization of seedbed microclimate, as well as modeling seed germination and establishment response of intermountain perennial grasses in competition with introduced annual weeds. His current interests include the development of weather and climate tools for diverse agricultural and natural resources modeling applications, but with specific emphasis on rangeland restoration and management. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stuart Hardigree. Hello, I'm here to talk about a weather-centric view for rangeland restoration and some tools that we've developed. Uh, I've given a lot of talks on a weather-centric view of restoration uh, planning and management. But this is the first talk I've given where we actually have some tools to show you that you can have access to that could assist you in your rangeland restoration planning. First, I'm going to talk about weather effects on uh, restoration and current management limitations induced by weather. Then I'll describe some of the online tools that we have currently for retrospective analysis of seeding trials and studies and tools that can be used to expand inferences from short-term field studies. And then I'll talk about how these tools can be used for adaptive management uh, planning and contingency planning under the type of uncertainty that we're faced with on western rangelands. I'll end with some emerging tools and applications that are part of the same tool development program uh, that should be tested and available in the very near future. Uh, and at the end, I'll talk about some educational resources that we have for developing a weather-centric uh, restoration approach and solicit feedback from managers and scientists in the audience about how these tools could be developed to better suit your needs uh, and be effective in the field. Uh, various people before me have talked about this sort of changing paradigm for rangeland restoration that even gets down to emergency fire uh, stabilization and rehabilitation. But historically, most of the money that's spent on what we would consider restoration activities like seeding or uh, recovery of suitable vegetation have been reactive management. Uh, when a big area burns, a lot of money is deployed. It has to be uh, processed rapidly into a plan for primarily stabilization of the soil resources opposed to restoration. This paradigm is changing and people are seeing ESR type programs as being a, an entry into maybe a longer term process that requires a, a longer term perspective. Um, but still all these processes are weather dependent. Most of the tools we use for establishing desirable plants after wildfire are designed to improve the likelihood of seeds getting in a place where they can successfully establish. Uh, we might uh, modify the seed bed, uh, use prescribed fire, uh, mulch, we might control weeds, we might search for better adapted plant materials. Unfortunately, every one of these processes can be derailed if the weather doesn't cooperate. Uh, cooperation by weather actually isn't just a short-term thing. Uh, most seeding studies uh, record some kind of weather attribute. Uh, usually it's the annual or seasonal weather in, in that particular year. But the re weather really needs to cooperate through a sequence of life cycle transitions. Uh, when you put seeds out in the Great Basin, you typically uh, plant after fire, after the fiscal year starts, which is October 1st, and before the soil freezes and makes it hard for getting the seeds in the ground. As long as the seeds haven't germinated, they're very relatively impervious to weather effects. Uh, but we're increasingly finding that one of the principal bottlenecks of successful seedling establishment is after they germinate, but before they emerge. Uh, we have a very large, extensive field study where we're looking at data throughout the Great Basin and good fall seasons are correlated with poor spring emergence. Um, what we're finding and other scientists are finding that the, when those seeds germinate, they become very vulnerable, vulnerable to what can be fairly short term mortality events from freezing and drought. Uh, 
if you get a lot of early germination, you're more vulnerable to uh, these destructive mortality processes in the winter. Once you emerge in the spring, you still have to have good conditions for initial seedling establishment and to get that seedling as robust as possible before the inevitable uh, dry season. And Matt even talked earlier about uh, seeing correlations between sagebrush seedling success and events that happen five years down the road. Um, so we really need to be cognizant that it's not just the some kind of weather metric like annual or seasonal precipitation, but it's really a, a sequence of events that's necessary to get a, a plant from its seed phase to something that, that's resistant and resilient in a mature plant community. This is a graph of seasonal distribution of precipitation and temperature in one of our sites near Boise, Idaho, and you can see the, the typical dry down in the summer cold temperatures in the winter and then in the spring there's kind of a competition between temperatures rising enough to support active growth and water drying out in the summer. The important thing about this uh, graph though are those error bars. In any given year you can have very wide variability in weather and as someone I guess I think it was Matt before talked about the kind of climate that you need to sustain a mature diverse plant community is is a lot different from those microclimatic requirements for some of these initial establishment processes. Uh, weather in the western U.S. is highly variable and it's also dry. Uh, this shows just a precipitation distri annual precipitation distribution in Boise, Idaho. The red bars are annual precipitation. Uh, the blue bars are spring pre precipitation. If you drill down into this uh, there are lots of years that have above average annual precipitation and that's if that's all you're recording when you're trying to understand a seeding trial you can miss the fact that you had one of the worst springs on on record. Seasonal variability is about twice as high as annual variability. In the uh, seeding literature um, most report that the studies that show success occurred in either average or above average years. Now if your primary uh, intervention is post-fire, that means any kind of ESR activity is going to be, have a fixed and low probability of success because you're dependent upon having those type of conditions, particularly if, as we've traditionally done it, you go in after the fire, you maybe put in one treatment and you don't follow up. Uh, that's why this paradigm is changing and people are looking at longer term solutions because just a one year intervention in the year after fire, it, it means you're going to be unsuccessful most of the time. Uh, David Pilliot at USGS has also looked at the correlation between what it takes to have a good fire year, a big fire year, and what it takes uh, to have a good restoration year afterwards. And if you have a pretty, uh, the kind of year that generates big fires, often the year after that fire is in the, this lower area of uh, precipitation. The finer the time scale, the more variable. Monthly variability in precipitation is twice as much as, say, spring variability, which is twice as, twice as much as annual variability. Uh, and this particular graph, 1989, was actually a pretty uh, wet year for annual precipitation. It had one of the lowest Mays on, on record, and Mays a critical period for seedling establishment to get going in the spring and survive the, uh, the summer. So the literature is biased. Uh, we get an overestimate of our abilities from the literature. Historically, we've looked at weather uh, mostly retrospectively to explain failure. Uh, if we're successful, we, we tend to claim that we have something on the ball and uh, we know what we're doing. Um, but if you're in one of these years down here for some critical period, this is those same years ranked for spring precipitation, it might be that no matter what you did, no matter how good your practices were, you would have probably failed for the most part. Uh, also, there's some years where you might have done things that in the long term weren't the best practices, but you can't really tell because you were successful, at least in the short term. Uh, the literature only publishes typically things that have some success that you can report. If everything you did failed, you're not going to get anything published. So the literature is somewhat biased. Uh, so it's very difficult to evaluate what, what was the weather component to your success or failure and what was your contribution. 
And that's what I'm going to talk about today, mostly some retrospective tools that we've developed to get a sense of what's going on at, at your seating location. Some of the important questions are uh, adaptive management was mentioned, learning while doing. Uh, how can we learn from experience given this high level of weather variability? How do we interpret field results, either positive or negative? Uh, from a scientific standpoint, how do we place our study in the perspective of long-term variability? And then, uh, more importantly, how do we plan for future uncertainty, particularly since the kind of land management plans we put together today are somewhat static and we have to say what we're going to do and predict what's going to happen in the future when in fact there might be a very long sequence of events or processes that have to be accounted for to reach whatever our goal state is for uh, diverse and resistant and resilient plant communities. Uh, we've been working through a, a USDA NIFA grant with John Aboxiglou at the University of Idaho he has a gridded weather product that we're basing some of these tools on. Uh, it might have been mentioned before. There's various gridded weather products out there that have various assumptions. Uh, we've been working with John Aboxiglou. This is his four kilometer weather product. It's based on, it's ultimately based on a gauge based system uh, used by the Climate Prediction Center. Uh, it has a little higher resolution than some traditional PRISM products have, although PRISM now has uh, daily products. And it is adjusted regionally uh, with products like PRISM uh, to account both for variability within the month. It's a daily weather product, uh, but also uh, variability in average conditions over space. This particular product is very useful if you're out in the middle of nowhere. Um, Perhaps somewhere in Nevada, there's not a weather station within miles, or there might be one that you have difficulty accessing right after a fire. Uh, you can get onto John's site, or you can get onto our uh, weather restoration site, uh, type in your latitude and longitude, uh, and get all kinds of weather information. This product goes back to 1979. It's daily weather data for a number of meteorological parameters. Uh, that can be used to run your ecological models, uh, precipitation, air temperature, wind speed, solar radiation, uh, and relative humidity. What we've done is package these in kind of a restoration specific uh, tool, sort of an ESD supplement. Uh, if you go to a place that you don't know much about, you might pull out an ESD if it's available, ecological site description, get information on the soils, get information on possible vegetation communities and what various states they might have been in. Uh, this also gives you a, a perspective, long-term perspective, on what the weather's like at this site. I'm first going to talk about how this tool can be used for retrospective assessment of, of historical plantings that you may have done or that are in the land treatment digital library. Um, and then I'll talk about how these tools can be used for proactive restoration planning in an uncertain future. Uh, one of the things we provide on this site is to take that long-term daily weather record for wherever you type in and soils information that we actually use to run microclimatic models to predict temperature and water availability in the seedbed uh, historically. Uh, we have a number of tools, one of which is a restoration-specific climatological report for historical assessment. Uh, this report takes that weather uh, data set from whatever location you enter and generates a fairly long report, but it's all digital. You can pull out pages that you might want to look at. Uh, the front page of this report gives some location information and a map. It's very important to confirm that the latitude and longitude you typed in is the correct one. Uh, we've made several mistakes in that area. It provides some general climatological distributions Historically, thing, maps like this have been used to justify seeding date decisions. You want to get things in before the principal time of water availability so your seeds can be there and experience any uh, favorable periods. Uh, we have this information that's automatically generated. Uh, but we also generate data on what type of winter you had and seasonal information on both favorability and some of these mortality factors like 
very fairly short-term daily type drought events and freezing mortality so that you can maybe go back in and parse out why a particular year failed if it's not obvious um, or maybe even understand why you had success in a particular year. So we also have a, a modeling tool that provides this kind of output for assessing what kind of um, what kind of stressful winter you had. We've broken some of these uh, outputs into uh, seasonal and monthly output. Uh, this is an October to June graph if you want to look at the principal period of initial establishment separate from annual variability and say precipitation. So you can look at your particular year and uh, pick out what kind of year that might have been at your site uh, if you're concerned about why you had failure or you want to understand success. We've also taken all the years and they're back to 79 and rank them so you can see where you are for particular uh, annual or seasonal metrics for precipitation. We have October to June, we have March to May, and then we have individual months. Um, some of these months are just a poison pill. If you have this kind of May, it doesn't much matter what else you did correctly. Uh, it's also important to understand the seasonality. If you want to think about uh, when you're planting in the fall, um, if you have a good fall, that can often mean a good cheatgrass establishment year. Uh, if you plant early in that fall and it's a good fall, you might get a lot of germination before the winter that facilitates mortality in the winter. If you have a really hard freeze, uh, that can be indicative of post-germination, pre-emergence mortality. If you have a lousy or a good spring, that can tell you something about seedling growth and survival. And even what's happening in the summer, you can have better or worse summers as far as seedling survival. Uh, this was generated for a site where we had a four-year field study where we only had one year with any significant restoration and uh, success. And that was a year uh, when outside of our plot study, we also planted the landscape. Uh, it was actually the second year we were controlling Medusa Head with plateau, uh, but then we had a really bad restoration year. Fortunately. The next fall, the plateau was still effective, and when we planted the second year, uh, we had really good success. So in this particular site, competition from annual weeds wasn't really a factor in the first couple of years. Um, it wasn't that great a fall, but through a number of logistical uh, mishaps, we ended up planting fairly late in the season, towards the end of November. We think that a lot of the seeds we planted uh, before it really got cold, uh, survived that initial cold period. And that's why we had such good uh, emergence. We had a pretty good fall, and we even had a good June, which is often a month later than you have any good conditions in the spring. So this allowed us to go back and ask, why is it that in the four years of the study, we only had one good year, and what were the characteristics of that year? Uh, so it would be possible also to go back retrospectively and use this kind of tool for meta-analysis of multiple seeding trials in the BLM or LTDL database or uh, previous efforts of your own. Uh, we also recommend that graphs from this report could be used in science publications when you're publishing your results. You can put those results in the perspective of long-term expectations at that site and perhaps expand inference beyond the one or two years you might have in a field study. Now, this is the type of graph that we, we recommend uh, being used. Uh, if you're two years of field study were up in this, you really have to look at that with something of a grain of salt, although in these systems, probably you can only expect a good restoration year every uh, four or five or six years, depending upon where you are. Um, and that's an important consideration in some of these longer term planning models. I'm going to talk about a couple aspects of adaptive management that were mentioned before. Department of Interior has put out some pretty extensive guidance on how you use adaptive management and planning. I'm not going to talk about all the things that are included, but I'm going to talk about two things. One that was mentioned earlier, learning while doing. 
uh, trying out different things, see how they work for, for future management guidance and adaptive iteration, uh, monitoring what you do uh, and deciding when you need to go back in and do something else. Now this is sort of an older adaptive management paradigm. It's almost uh, more suitable for an agricultural application where you're controlling the environment, you're irrigating, you're controlling the seedbed and the weeds. You go out, you have a whole bunch of options you want to test. You don't know what will be best. Uh, you look at the relative success and then in the future you use the outcomes that are positive. Uh, weather can screw that up uh, and give you virtually no information. This is a more weather-centric adaptive management approach where you have your different options and you have different levels of success. Often we aren't successful. A lot of times we're unsuccessful, but most of the time we're partially successful. Um, regardless of that, if you're unsuccessful and it was a poor weather year, you can't really toss out your preferred treatment. You don't really know how well it would have worked in a year where you had some options. Uh, but if you're successful, you also have to consider whether uh, in a good weather year uh, all of your treatments are as good as you think relatively um, because the weather really participated in that success. Uh, but what happens if we want to take a much longer term approach? We're now talking about using ESR maybe as a trigger for a longer series of restoration activities, but if you're writing an EA under NEPA, historically, you'd have to say what you were going to do, evaluate the alternatives, do it, and then that was it. Uh, we really need more of a decision-making framework uh, so that we might know what happens in the first year. We might be unsuccessful, we might be partially successful, but we don't know what to do after that partial success. Say you have sagebrush coming in with a cheatgrass understory. A lot of our restoration activities are through controlled disturbance. You don't want to eliminate the success you had. Uh, this is just a schematic of a successional uh, ecologically based restoration model. Uh, most people have an, a successionally, succession oriented model that they use. Uh, really what we need to be able to do is write EAs where we have contingencies on how we will decide what to do next in an uncertain future given that we really don't know what's going to happen but we do know we're going to have to go back in and re-intervene until we get uh, whatever we consider successful as a goal state. There's some real exciting developments. Um, most of these historical tools are more scientifically useful for understanding what has happened in the past or for running models and doing sensitivity analysis. What managers could really use are, is seasonal forecasts where uh, they can make a decision in October whether to plant at all, as someone mentioned earlier. If it's going to be the worst year on record uh, and you knew it was going to be the worst year, maybe you don't want to waste your money as long as the soil is stable. Uh, if it's going to be the best restoration year on record, that's when you might want to spend $400 a pound on some native Forbes seed. Uh, John Aboxaglue has taken the Climate Prediction Center's uh, seasonal forecasts uh, they're an ensemble forecast. He's disaggregated them into the different forecasts. Um, and it's turning out that seasonal forecasts at the Climate Prediction Center are usually an ensemble model because if you're trying to detect global things, that works the best. But individual models in this ensemble work better for different places, for different initial periods, and for different forecast intervals. So what we'll be doing in the next year is explicitly testing in different environments. Uh, when do you have to make your decision? What's the forecast length? Uh, what processes are important? So for the area around Boise, we will be looking for kind of an aggregate forecast sometime in October. Uh, how good is the fall going to be? How cold is the winter going to be? How good is the spring going to be? And it might be that we don't have to have perfect skill in forecasting all weather. All we have to do is pick up those signals uh, of that one in five year type of, uh, year. We also have some educational resources on this website to teach you about these tools. Right now they're primarily focused at sort of a university level restoration class audience. Um, you can take a look at these things. 
we have a paper coming out in rangeland ecology and management that'll point you to the new website uh, can always be found as a link through the great basin far science exchange um, but what we're concerned about in this upcoming year is interacting with land managers as to how they might use tools like this uh, get feedback on what would be most useful and develop more of a partnership moving forward as we uh, introduce seasonal forecast tools and even climate change tools the way we understand our environment today is through models that have weather inputs climate change projections are probabilistic this tool is also going to provide weather time series from future potential environments so we can run our models now and run our models in the future and uh, and compare them uh, mark brunson and gwinder meredith are going to be out this door at a table with a survey uh, particularly if you're a restoration specialist we'd like you to fill out our form and give us some feedback on what type of weather tools uh, would be useful to you whether these are useful to you these are the three questions that are going to be uh, on the form we'd really like to get feedback and we'd really like to generate some partnerships as we develop these type of tools in the future any questions underlying weather tool is for the contiguous 48 states uh, the particular restoration tool the report and those things that we're providing are sort of geared towards western rangeland systems right now they're optimized for great basin systems there are a number of assumptions uh, that it's a post fire or post disturbance landscape um, but yeah, if you just want weather data or you want this type of report just on the weather data, you can get it for the whole US. Other thing we're doing this year is migrating some of the underlying model and database tools to a USDA big data server so these things can be provided more rapidly. Uh, we're also trying to target other natural resource and agricultural applications and provide the full spectrum of a weather toolbox from historical analysis to location and uh, application specific seasonal forecasts and for climate change projections and we're trying to line up five to ten uh, modeling collaborators in hydrology and agronomy and natural resource science uh, to work with us so we can tailor some of these outputs specifically to run their models or to help with an interface to make these models useful for other people. All right, thank you.